could you tell us a little bit of who you are and what do you do? Well, good afternoon. I, my name is Tang Ha Lai, and I'm an author. And I've been invited here to Dover, and it's been a lovely visit to talk about Inside Out and Back Again, which is a novel that has been taught here, I've been told, for the last decade. So it's such an honor for me to meet not just the eighth graders who are reading it right now, but I think all the way from sixth grade up to graduating seniors. So it's fun. It's yeah. really and it is such an honor to have you here. I remember reading the book in eighth grade, and it was definitely stuck with me. And I reread it for this interview, as well as your new sequel. Yay! <laughs> and it just brought me back to those times, and I really appreciate it. So we're going to just start with some basic author questions. Okay. Uh, what made you want to be an author? I am an author by default. I am not a kid who grew up reading and I read so much I fell out of my treehouse or anything like that. I'm a war child. So I came here as a refugee and I had to learn this language called English. And I concentrated so much on learning it, I shredded apart American Heritage Dictionaries because I wanted to understand not just how to speak it, but understand the nuances behind the language. And I wanted to speak it as well as my mother speaks Vietnamese, and she's a house poet. So I needed to get it to that level. And after you've spent that long concentrating on the language, you're gonna to wanna to use it, right? So who uses words the most? At first I was a journalist, and then I segued into fiction, so now I am an author. So I really think if I'd been left alone and there wasn't a war, I would be something like a naturalist, because that's really where my brain is. You know, I like to be outside, I like animals. But you know, you go where life leads you, and then so I ended up being a, a writer. Uh, and what kind of authors do you like or that you look up to? I, you know, you, I have shifted. I used to read a lot of fiction, but I've shifted to nonfiction because, because of migraines. I no longer read on paper. I listen to a lot of audio. So when you do audio, that it lends itself to uh, nonfiction. So I'm, anything with animals, anything with trees, anything with a, a person who interests me. But I do fiction too, but not such dense fiction that you actually need to read a page three times to get the meaning. That I can't do anymore. But I, I just, you know what? It doesn't even matter. I just pick up a book and I start, or, or I just start <laughs> listening to books now. I, I listen to anything. Right. And what is the hardest thing about being a writer? Sitting still. <laughs> I'm not, I don't sit still well by nature. I think I'm supposed to be outside chasing a squirrel or something. I have no idea, but I, I, it's not this. I find sitting still and it's such a slow craft. There's no way to do it fast. I've tried. And there's no way to do it simultaneously with any other activity, like biking, walking, you, gardening. You can't. You have to sit and you have to concentrate because sometimes you're just moving one word over here and then six hours later you move that same word back over here. I have heard of authors who can read in, uh, uh, in cafes. They will go to a coffee shop and write because they like the background noise. I am not that author. I have to be completely be myself, um, be by myself. So it feels very cave-like, this activity. I don't you know, I, I don't get enough social interaction probably. It, it does change your personality. I used to be a journalist. And I, I remember talking to at least 100 people a week. I mean, you're just out all the time. And now it's just me, my two dogs, my daughter, my husband, and then I see some neighbors. You know, it's like your, your world just becomes much more insulated. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and so this month is NaNoWriMo, or National Novel Writing uh -huh. Month. Uh, what piece of advice would you give to aspiring novelists? To be any kind of a writer, you have to read because you have to know what you like. And there's so many different examples out there. So I would read, 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 read. And if you happen upon a, a, a novel or a book that you really write, take it home and like shred it apart and from that novel figure out why the author did what she did. Why introduce a character here? Why these sentence structures? Why this voice? Why, where, did, where is it set? It's called a narrative perch. When did the story begin and how does it end? And does it have a flashbacks? If you ask all those questions, you're on your way to becoming a, a writer. I'm talking about a novelist because all those answers have to be, I mean, all those questions have to be answered in order to put a book together. Mm -hmm. uh, and could you tell us a little bit about your journey from writing it to publication? Um, it's a long process. I started writing right after college because I, I majored in journalism and I was a journalist, but I had already had dreams of, of becoming a fiction writer, so I would write at home. And it took me 20 years just because, one, I had no idea what I was doing, and two, it's just I, I, I just didn't write anything publishable for that long. Why? Because I was overly ambitious. My first novel just kind of fell apart because it spanned like 5,000 years, had 50 characters, and you do that when you're young and you have so much energy. And... Um, but it didn't go anywhere. So I just think it's just one of, it just takes a long time. And even when your manuscript is accepted and you have an editor, it's still another two years from the time of submission. 
um, because you have to rewrite. And then after the rewrite, then it's another year for them to get the cover, the copy editing done. It's a long, long process. So sometimes you have already on to your next project before your, that other book came out and you've, you've kind of forgotten all about it because you're so into your current project. So it's just the way publishing works that by the time it comes out, you've already distanced yourself from it, which is good in a way, because then whatever reviews say or whatever sales are happening, it doesn't really affect you because you've got this other project that you're, you have a deadline. And uh, what are the hardest part about writing these kinds of books? Because your books are aimed more towards middle schoolers, so their attention spans are really short, and you just kind of have to meet the You know what? I don't spend any time thinking about them because I'm like, I don't think about my audience so much as I kind of know where, I think about my character. My character just happens to be 10 years old, ha, huh? the same age I was when I came to the States. That's why I'm writing to this age group. I'm writing about myself and, of course, twisting the narrative so that it becomes fiction. But if I had landed here at 18, I would be a YA author. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I, I'm very practical. I'm like, okay, I was 10. All my memories are, are colorized by someone who's 10. How does a 10-year-old see the world? How does a 10-year-old interact with her mother, her brothers, the food around her, the school, English, all that? It's from a 10-year-old's point of view. So accidentally, I went into the middle grade uh, range, which I love. It, it all worked out. So I'm like, just write what you want to write and everything else will work out. I didn't even know there was a thing called middle grade until my editor told me. You know, I, don't, I don't plan things, it just happened. <laughs> uh, so now on to Inside Out and Back again. Mm -hmm. So you shared in other interviews as well as the presentation you gave today that many of Ha's experience has happened to you. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us what the line is between real and fictional? I don't even know anymore because I lie so well now <laughs> that I just lie. There's life and I do know that I was a girl in Vietnam. I was born in Vietnam. We indeed left Vietnam right before the war ended in 75. I do have a missing in action father. I do have a mom. In real life, I have six brothers. I had to narrow it down to three brothers for the novel. I left out two sisters. So, so much of life, but the emotional depth is real. How I felt when I was made to feel like the dumbest kid in class, that's real. Did I actually go to the board and write out a math, uh, mathematical formula? Probably not. I had to make that up, you know, to make the scene real. But the feelings are real, and then everything else you kind of make up. Like, for example, the chick and the doll. There was a chick, my brother raised chicks, and I had a doll, but I didn't bring them on the ship. You know, I had to bring them on the ship in the novel just to make a sad part, because, you know, when you write, you want sad, happy, sad, happy. So right then I just needed the sad part. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned today that there you had more parts about uh, Vietnam mm -hmm. that ended up getting cut. Uh -huh. Could you tell us like what exactly got cut? Probably a lot more of the sensories, what it was like to eat certain snacks, what it was like to walk through, uh, probably a lot more about the open market because that was a big part of my life. I shopped with my family. My mom trained me to do it since I was eight. A lot more about um, uh, boys versus girls, how they're raised, because it was a very gender strict uh, society. This is back in 1975. And uh, uh, a lot of what my mom taught me a girl should be and how much I rebelled. So a lot more of that. And what it was like to sit in a school uh, in Vietnam. In school, for example, you don't have your own individual desk. It's two to a space. So you have a tandem desk. So you always have a buddy next to you. And so what that was like, what was it like for me to sneak all my snacks and eat during class? I did all of that. And I think a lot of that got cut out because it wasn't essential to the story. Um, so you just released a sequel called When Clouds Touch Us. Uh, why did you decide to write the sequel 12 years later? Because I signed this thing called a contract. <laughs> this is how practical my brain is. I was like, what is it that... It's because I traveled a lot and I, and I had um, been visiting a lot of schools and kids and, and teachers said, well, what happened to her? Because her story just kind of ends after one year, but we, are, we know that the resettlement process takes years and probably decades. So then what happens to her? So then I was like, well, I'll just tell them when it causes us, it's really a story about how hard it is to resettle. And in many ways, it's even more daunting than fleeing a war because it's slower and it's much more, um, it, it, you have to, there are many, many more steps to it. When you flee a war, you pack your bag and you run. But how do you reclaim a part of yourself to the point where you feel at home in the new place? That's a long, long process. Mm -hmm. And that's what when clouds, you know, that's why I wanted to write when clouds just us. Just recognizing that all the people, the million, millions of people who've had to resettle all over the world, just to recognize how hard it is. But then it, it does work out. It just, you have to be patient. Yeah. And was there anything from either of the, these books that you uh, 
just felt you wish you did differently or you wish you added? I don't think so. I'm, I, I, I'm usually, you know, if my, I'm just, again, very, if I wanted to add it, I would have added it. <laughs> there it is. So, and, and when class just us, it pretty much, there wasn't a lot of editing. Whatever was there was there. So, um, you know, whatever I put in is there. So I'm, I'm happy with it. Okay, good. Uh, do you feel that was anything left unsaid about Inside Out and Back Again or When Clouds Touch Us? I don't think so. I, I, I tend not to give lessons. I'm not a, a writer where you read my book and you instantly can pick out the lesson. I leave that task up to the English teachers and they do a fabulous job of extrapolating what is being said. My job is to put the words on a page in a way that make them dance. <laughs> and if I do that, then I think my job's done. <laughs> Um, so what was it like to have to write this down and relive the memories and what did you realize uh, or learn about uh, yourself as you reflected? You know what, by the time I sat down to reflect, I was older. I think if I had sat down and wrote this when I was in my 20s, it would be a much more angry book because it had just happened. But by the time I sat down, I was in my early 40s. So many other things have happened in my life. I've gone through my 20s, my 30s, my 40s that, um, you know, what happened to you at 10, it was so long ago that it almost seems to be funny. I mean, think about it. I was the first real life Asian any of my classmates or teachers had ever seen. Just think about what, what I was like. I might as well just have been an alien. So I don't hold grudges against them. I, I, I understand that it was difficult. And there was no such word as multiculturalism. There was no such thing as anti-bullying. None of that existed. So I just kind of got plopped down into this world and I just survived. Um, <laughs> And so, was it hard? Did I cry? No, I was just more like, okay, this is what happened. And again, it's, it's been fictionalized. So, I can't even begin to, to extrapolate what's real and what's real or not, because it all got intermingled. Um, I, I, I extrapolated from my life what I needed in order to make this fictional narrative work. Mm -hmm. um, so, steering away from being an author in Inside Out and Back mm -hmm. Again, uh, you started a nonprofit called Viet Kids. Mm -hmm. And what inspired you to start the organization? You know, back in 2005, I went to Vietnam as a translator for a group of surgeons who went there to do cleft palate surgeries. And we were out in the countryside. Now, when you talk about Vietnam, you have to differentiate between city and country. They're like two different worlds. We were operating in the, sit in, in the countryside where people are poor. And I asked the kids who showed up, what is one present I can get you, right? And I'm thinking with my Western brain, you'd want a food. Like I can run really quick and get you a candy or a cookie and you'll be happy. Every single one of them said, I want a bicycle. And I thought, why? And it turned out that if you start talking to them, a bicycle acts as a family car. The mom will drive two or three kids on the same bicycle, all, pa all you know, they figure it out how to sit on a bicycle. She'll drop them off at school and then she takes that same bicycle and drops off vegetables or whatever she's selling to the market. And then, so, so a whole livelihood can happen. And also when you get a ride to school, you're not so exhausted by the time you get there. And so then you're able to concentrate. So I just thought with this one gift, um, I think it's gone up to $100 a bike now. It was 75 when I started. But this one gift, you can change the dynamic of a whole family, not just that one child. And very, you know, I don't know about now, but back then very few children had a bike to themselves. They had to share it. So I thought, okay, this is one way to just alter um, the family makeup. So, that, so then I came back and I just started. So now all my school visit um, fees just go to VIT Kids. Oh, nice. So. Um, how was the struggle against racism and xenophobia in your adult life uh, and in the process of creating and publishing your books? You know what? I, I, I would love to say there's no such thing as racism because we all know it's out there. But I will say that for me, as the way I live as an author, I live in a cave. You don't even have the opportunity to be racist to me because I'm inside my room writing. I come out, look at the trees, and I come right back in. There's just not a lot of interaction. You know, I mean, who am I going to get racist remarks from my husband and my child, right? <laughs> These are the people I see. So it doesn't affect me. And I want to emphasize that is not to say that it is not out there. Absolutely is out there. But, you know, it's just, I don't, it's not a part of my world simply because I live like a writer. Okay. Um, so to, on a little more depressing note, uh -huh. uh, we live in a time where wars are really rampant and people are being dra like torn from their homes with like Russia and Ukraine and uh -huh. Israel and Hamas. Uh -huh. uh, what would you say to someone that had to be forced in the position you were in as a young child having to be fleeing from their home? 
I would acknowledge how hard it is. I would never say, oh, it's, you know, it's going to be fun. It is not fun. We, not, we all know that. And I will also acknowledge how long the process of self-reclamation is. It will take decades. That is not to say it won't happen. So I would have to say, let's just be patient with yourself and with other people. People will say things to you because they don't know anything about you other than what's been reported. And having been inside a history, I know that what's on TV is 1% of what's actually being felt and lived on the ground. And just, you know, if you have the energy, correct them. If not, just let it go because there will be so many other things you're dealing with. You're not going to have time to correct every single human. And you're not going to have time to be slighted and feel hurt by every single comment because it's out there. All you can do is focus. And that's what the gift my mother gave us. She said, just focus. The first focus is learn English. So we all learned English. Second focus, focus, go to college. You're going to college. Then after college, get your job. You know, there's so much, and all of that's really hard, for, especially for someone who's coming into English, uh, having to learn it. That's, that takes plenty of energy. You don't have time to be posting on social media about how you feel about every single thing, unless that's your thing. Unless that is what makes you feel good, then go at it, all right? I just came up in a time where we didn't have any of that. And so I've learned to focus. You know, I knew that I wanted to be, not, I didn't want to just learn English. I wanted to master it. So then I had to focus. I knew that I, journalism somehow just didn't cut it. It wasn't enough for me to run around and do the how, uh, you know, what, when, why, and how. I wanted to craft sentences. You don't craft sentences in daily journalism. You craft sentences in fiction. So how do you switch to that? I had to figure it out. And I was so focused and busy with all that, I really don't have time to run around and be hurt by so many other things that are going on. And then... You know, I think once you focus, and then things will start to happen. Now, the question I'm often asked is, what happened if you, you wrote and wrote and never got published? I would still be okay. I would simply go on and do something else. I wouldn't be sitting here interviewing with you because there would be no reason for us to meet. But I would be somewhere else. I would be, I'm, I will happily raise chickens. I will be happily be an arborist. I just read in the Times that there's actually a person with a job who gets to go around and decide which trees get planted where in New York City parks. I would love that job, <laughs> right? So there are just all these jobs I can do. So I just don't worry about, um, you know, the, what could have been and how hurt I could have been. I, what I spend time thinking about is what else is out there to do? Just how fun it is to go out there and do something else, right? Every other job I think of involves being outside because that's how tired I am of being tied to my chair. <laughs> well, it's very nice to meet you. And one more time, could you just say who you are and what you do? My name is Tang Ha Lai, and I'm an author.